don't rush. It's not about the getting, it's, it's about the journey. 100%, I was always in a rush to get to the end. The end is the end of your life. I don't want to be there yet. I'm enjoying where I am now, but just to take the time, do things properly. And, and the other key thing is, um, someone once said to me, and I didn't get it straight away, was exchange in abundance. I really truly believe that um, what you give and the energy you put out there and, and how you are to other people, um, will definitely come back tenfold. So in everything you do, um, exchange in abundance. And enjoy the journey. The Few Podcast with uh, Boo and Sean. We'd love to thank our uh, sponsors, ICMI, Momentum Media, Afterburner, Sean Sewell, in a circle as we bring to you today, uh, Deb Deeth, a wonderful uh, entrepreneur and owner of Greater Glass uh, in Sydney. We're going to share a few stories today about her success, but also maybe COVID isn't doom and gloom uh, after all. Uh, Sean, pretty excited to get started today. How are you, mate? Uh, great, mate. Absolutely. Really looking to get stuck in and uh, and uh, get stuck with our first uh as you said, the inaugural podcast and welcome a very good friend and client of mine, uh, Deb Deeth from Greater Glass. Now, uh, Deb runs yeah, Greater Glass in Sydney, in Southern Sydney, uh, has been running it for a period of time. Uh, as I understand it, it was originally her husband's business. Uh, she then took the reins because he was focusing more on glazing than being a business owner. And uh, eventually, and I'll, I'll say this with, you know, love and and and, uh, and uh, i suppose positivity the utmost respect of course yeah, with much respect that's it that uh, <laughs> that you may have sacked your husband from the business at some point um so that you could actually keep going and growing the business but uh, welcome deb it's great to have you on board thank you you've got to make the tough calls in business don't you deb you know you can't make the one that's always going to be uh, the the popular vote sometimes you've got to do what's in the best interest of the business <laughs> absolutely right. i think it definitely was wasn't it deb yeah, that's right. And your relationship. And and that was the number one thing. It was about saving our marriage, really. Anyone that's worked with their partner before, I'm sure, understands exactly where I'm coming from there. Absolutely. Do you think it's possible? I mean, do you, I, I, I uh, recently or until a couple of years ago uh, had a similar scenario. It's so difficult, isn't it, to keep work at work and, and home at home. I mean, it's. I take my hat off to, to people that navigate it uh, and do you think it is possible, Deb? Do you think there's personality types that can do it? Or Absolutely. Is, uh... I, yeah, I do. I do think it's possible. Uh, I think uh, there's a lot of successful family businesses out there and some of them have um, been successful for generations that also have their children on board. Um, for us, it's the still work does not um, stay at work, even though uh, Phil, my husband, doesn't work directly in the business anymore. He's still uh, very vested um, and and is my life partner and we still talk about it at home from time to time. Uh, the thing that um, works well now is because operationally he's not there, I can actually run, he's not close to the situation. So now I, I have um, an advantage of uh, running things past him and he's not in the politics of the day to day and, and the people. So he's more uh, neutral. He's more neutral. Absolutely. And so he's he's a much better advisor um, to the business. And he's still very much uh, a master glazier and um, a person in the industry. So, yeah, he offers a lot of advice um, from the sideline now, which um, which I prefer. So, yeah, it's good. Excellent. Excellent. Well, we might jump into the first question, eh, Boo? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we, we, uh, we're super excited uh, to, I guess, Deb, what we try to introduce to people and something about the few is this really running your own business, uh, being able to uh, effectively hunt and gather for yourself is is something that is incredibly challenging and the statistics are thrown around. It might be one in 10 people can run a, su a successful business on a, on a sustainable basis. What, what is it? that got you excited about being in business and 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 to to go on this journey because you've got to be a little bit of a glutton for punishment to, to own and operate your own business, don't you? Yeah, but I think going in, people don't realise that. They think, oh, I'm going to have all this free time. I'm going to make lots of money. But it's actually, it is a slog. It's, it's, it's hard work. We didn't consciously set out to create a glass business. It just evolved um, to where we are today. And that um, was a set of circumstances. It was just prior to the GFC and and my husband was working for a glass company and I'd sort of studied a bit of business and was working in the corporate 
uh, scenario. Deb, Deb, did you enjoy working corporate? Was that we, we, did you always have itchy feet before this opportunity presented itself, or was it just kind of an organic transition? It was a bit of an organic transition, but there are a number of factors that occurred, including um, me having a child and there being lots of um, terrorism sort of scenarios and scares in Sydney at the time. So I was travelling on a train and being pregnant and, and Phil lost his job. And, and then there was a number of factors that led to where we are today. And um, so I didn't actually purposely set out to create a business. However, I think when um, I wasn't in corporate and I was on, I was on maternity leave at the time. And I, I, I guess I do... I think it's the, it was a creative thing more than a, a financial thing. It was, it was the, the, the aspiration to build something from the ground up and look, we'll get a logo and we'll do this and we'll do that. And, and just the, and the, it kind of went from there, it kind of snowballed to, gee, we can, we can really have something here. And I think that was all in my head, not Phil's head. Phil's head was just go and put glass in holes and, <laughs> And, and get an invoice out there. Yeah, for amazing. me, I, I was like a million miles into two years ahead of myself. And, and, and you've, been, you've been quite heavily involved in the glazing industry as well, haven't you? Yeah. And, and then the one thing led to another and then someone tapped me on the shoulder and said, oh, we need a, we need a voice, um, a particularly a female voice um, associated with on the board for the glass association. And, and I just, I was passionate about the product. I actually do think it, it's an amazing product and people don't understand the different things that you can do with glass. So that. And I, I love it. I've got glass everywhere. The whole studio here is glass, glass, glass. It just it connects you, connects you with the, with nature and the outside world. Absolutely. So, so, um, Obviously, you, you know, you know, one of the things that I'm very, uh, I suppose, stand for is around success and the concept of success being a holistic thing, not a, not an attainment of a goal. It's a state of mind. It's a state of being, rather than you know, when I have this, when I do this, when I'm known for that, you know, when I've got a private jet and a Ferrari or whatever. Um, that that success is a state. It's a it's a state of being. And and I guess you know the, the question for you, Deb, do you? You know, when you wake up in the morning, most days, I don't think it's going to be every day, but the majority of the time when you wake up in the morning, do you feel um, like a success? And, and if so, or if not, why? Like what, what, how does that, how does that sort of feel for you? If you had have asked me that question, probably two or three years ago, I wouldn't have known how to answer it. So the short answer is yes. Right now, I absolutely wake up in the morning and feel like the success for me is choice. It's actually having, it's not a thing. Like I said, it's not a bank account with a million dollars in it. It's actually a feeling and it's a feeling that, that everything's okay. It is a, it is a sense of contentment yep. and that, that just didn't happen. Uh, there's a number of things that I have worked on in myself over the last few years, probably since meeting you, Sean, if I'm honest. And that was doing a lot of work um, on myself and trying to define, and it's not so much a purpose, it is, it is actually a feeling. So for me, that was working out what my core values are and then understanding that when I don't feel uh, when there's a bit of unrest within myself, it's generally because one of my core values, uh, I'm either not living it um, and I'm out of alignment with it. And, and once, once I understand, once I understood what those values were, then I can, I, I sort of mould and, and work around them. And, and so for instance, one of my main core values is connection. So if I have a a loss of connection with one of my close or one of my uh, leadership team members or, or one of my kids um, until I've resolved that and I used to let it fester and I don't anymore until yeah, I resolve I that uh, yeah it does it really weighs me down and I I, I just spent I spent two hours with a team doing exactly this it's just like look stop we, we are skirting a massive issue here no one wants to be the person that that actually puts it out there and then once it's out there Ah, it's like a it's like a sense of relief to everyone, isn't it? And you could just, yeah, and just move forward. Yeah. Move, it's, move, it's, it's constantly those, moving forward. Crucial conversations we have to have that we we tend to avoid because we make up what the outcome is going to be, or we're attached to how someone should or shouldn't re react or respond to that. But in the end, it doesn't matter how someone reacts or responds. 
it's it's our it's our intentionality and how we deliver the message that counts. That person could be all happy about it. That person could go and yell and scream and and slam the door on the way out. That's their stuff, not our own. So when you, as you say, Deb, when you come back to that, and I know that knowing you and and, and forming a, a, a friendship with you over the last few years as well, understanding there's a lot of similarities there. That same thing. My deep connection is is my number one value, and and my definition of success, which is a process I go through with my clients, is helping them to, to define success is the freedom to choose and the impact I have on those around me. And now the, what we've seen is that um, the, the, during this COVID thing in the last three months of kind of been trapped at home, I haven't had as much freedom to choose and I haven't had as much of an impact on people around me because I haven't been able to get out of the state to do my events and things like that I normally do. So I have felt that kind of lower my, my feeling of, of success because of limiting those two things that are most important to me. So it's a really important thing that, you know, that anyone obviously listening as well should, should be considering and what is it that you define as success? What does it, what is so important to you that you could wake up in the morning, despite not having achieved all your goals, despite having had a crap day yesterday, what is it that actually makes you feel successful? And it's really, really important to do that. A lot of people don't. Mm. It, you, you, right. It actually changed my life. And it wasn't so much defining the definition. It was having a self-awareness of when, I, when I'm when i not um, feeling my best um, mentally, for, for want of a better word, or I just something doesn't feel right, it's identifying what it is. And, and usually it always comes back to um, a misalignment with my core values. Yeah, absolutely. Obviously something's out of way. And, and- and how did how did that feel? Uh, how did that feel, Deb? Like, if you look at when you started out on, on this adventure, and uh, I guess with most uh, most adventures like this, you have in your back of your mind that this is going to be successful. But what does success feel like today with, with that self awareness compared to the many years that you were successful, obviously, but w- without the level of awareness that you have today? What what is what, what does the day to day different f- feel like? And is there anything you could you could share with people to help them get there faster? The number one thing for me is it's all about me. That sounds extremely selfish. However, my business uh, doesn't operate without um, a leader being um, content. If, if, if that's, I'm not sure exactly how to put words around it. However, if I walk into our um, showroom today or our office and I'm in a shit mood, it has a drastic effect on everybody else. And I I didn't acknowledge the power um, that I had or even that one person has. So it's really about um, aligning your team with your values as well. And, and, And that takes courage because people think, oh, what a load of bullshit this is but it absolutely makes an amazing difference. So as soon as I worked out what my core values were and what my business stood for, and then once my team um, got on board with that and did similar exercises, I think a lot of them uh, were like me, very sceptical about that at first, but it really is about looking um, inside yourself because it's not, business is not about business. Business is about people. Yep. Everything's yeah. about people and personalities and if you can manage your own personality and have a positive effect on those around you of course people are going to want to do business with you so i think what you're referring to before you have the contentment it's about it's it's your state it's controlling that your state you know your mental emotional energetic state how you show up and if you show up um kind of as I said off kilter or pissed off or, or upset or flat then straight away that that flows down to your team and you'll start to see that reflected in what's going on. And whether we like it or not, as leaders in our businesses, um, what's going on is our fault, you know? And and if if everyone's kind of flat and stuff, you've got to look in the mirror and say, okay, well, how am I creating that? Because definitely is a big, big part of that. So, and I know when you introduced those values fairly early on of us you know, starting to work together nearly three years ago, um, what percentage of your team did you replace in the subsequent, you know, three to six months after you started to introduce that? Uh, 50 to 75% at a guess. <laughs> yeah. Which is quite normal. That, ha- that can happen when you start to say, Hey guys, this is what we stand for. This is why we do what we do. This is what our goal is. And this is who we need to be. People start to either get attracted to it or repelled from it. And the values in that business 
as they become part of the DNA and you use it in your language every day and, and you assess people's performance based first and foremost on their alignment with the values, not on the performance of their tasks. Because they're aligning to the values, generally speaking, they will be performing the tasks at a high level. But it's usually when something happens and that shifts that you need to then jump in and have those crucial conversations with people and say, hey, what's happening? I noticed you were living this value at a really high level, but something's changed. Can I, can I support you? How can we help? You know, and it's, it's, it's more collaborative approach that way, but it definitely makes a in, improvement to the culture, doesn't it, Deb? A hundred percent. And interestingly, what happens when you bring a new person into your culture that is that you thought was um, aligned that isn't, they're, they're repelled by the others that are there that just it's never me dismissing people. Um, it's always about the rest of the team um, realising that, gee, this person is, just doesn't fit. So it, it is a natural attrition, then they, they end up leaving if that's the case. It's great, isn't it? It's a, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a, a, peer, a, a peer group that holds everyone accountable to the standard that you as a leader would like them to be accountable to. Uh, it's, it's a very, very powerful thing that you've done there, Deb. What are the interesting things about success, uh, Deb, is when you look at Instagram, when you listen to motivating speakers or influencers, uh, by and large, success seems to be something that's just grinding a hard work. Uh, and very few of these um, successful people uh, talk about the many, many failures that they've experienced to get there. Uh, is there any failure that you had, Deb, in your journey? So anything that really shook you to the core that allowed you to improve or become more successful uh, in your career as a businesswoman? Um, the word failure, I, it never really, it's just, it, it might sound strange, but it's just not ever been in my vocabulary. I just, I, I couldn't even... I don't think I've ever failed. I've, I've, I've made mistakes and I've learned from things, but I, I just don't use the word fail. And I, I it's just, I, I don't know whether it was in my, my upbringing, but we just, it's not a, we don't fail. There's been many things that have shook me to the core and I look back on and think, oh my God, unloading a piece of glass in my pyjamas um, with my next door neighbour in the slippers in the rain in, on my sloping driveway that weighed 100 kilos was probably not a good move back in the day and probably broke my neighbour's back. Um, other instances... Great neighbour, though. What a, what a yeah, step I, in there and help you with that one. Wow. You, you really know who your neighbours are then. <laughs> She's still my best friend to this day. And, and, and I would never do that now. Um, other, other things was just being really... Um, having been a poor judge of character. Look, I've had team members that are, that have, you know, done drugs in the toilet, that have thrown hammers on work sites, that have I've called police on people when I've locked myself in my office. Look, I've made some really poor choices, <laughs> tradesmen. So, but you can't. I don't think you can be a good judge of character until you've been a bad a bad one. Yeah, yeah, probably. Yeah. And I think also making desperate um, in it, depending on, you know, the economy when, when construction was booming sort of five years ago or more. And you, you know, you, you had to sort of, there was a bit of a take what you can get to fulfill the jobs. If I, knowing what I know now, if I was in that scenario today, I would not take the work on if I didn't have the adequate resources to. Well, but one of the things I've seen too, Deb, over the time though, in that I've known you, is that you've grown your business substantially, but your team hasn't grown by the same number of multiples, has it? You become more effective as a team and you're getting more work coming through, like more outcomes with in a more efficient and effective way because you've got higher caliber people in the team. Absolutely. So even since COVID, we've dropped two and added one. So we're still sort of one um, full-time equivalent behind where we were in March. However, our numbers are certainly not reflecting that right now. So, yeah, I, I think that's definitely the case. And, and one of our core values as a team is um, continue, you know, improving continuously. And uh, that's certainly uh, the case. That's a great value to have is, is always being you know, consistently looking for ways to innovate, to improve. Um, you know, I've seen it in your business, seen it in many businesses. There's a good friend of mine, um, also in a circle, uh, Deb uh, Darren, who has uh, a TerraCorp up in Darwin. And he bought the business about eight, seven or eight years ago. 
Uh, it was doing, I think, under, under 50 tonne of product a month. He's now doing over 400 tonne a month with the same team members and uh, without having any additional shifts or anything. And it's that thing about there's always a way to improve. You can always do something better. You can always do something faster. And it comes down to, I know some of the stuff that obviously that you teach, Boo, with the, um, with the whole concept of debriefing is, is going and figuring out what was our outcome, what happened, you know, what's our response to that, and then move, apply that learning and then take it into the next situation the same. And it's one of those things that most business owners that, that, that aren't successful, I guess the, the, some of the context of, of the few is around, uh, and I like the way you put it, Boo, about looking through a piece of glass is the reference you use. So interestingly, we're talking about glass. Not, not just because we have you on the show, Dan, no, but we not, actually, we're talking, we're we actually okay, did okay. use that analogy to, <laughs> to like, say, hey, how do you, you know, so, when you're a younger or when we're aspirational, it always feels like there's a bit of glass between you and the person you want to be. And, and, and a few of us manage to break through and, and get, to the, get to be the, the, the person that we, that we want to be. And, and I think one of those key attributes, as you've, you've highlighted, is it's all about me. And, and when it's all about you, it's good and a bad thing. And, and always got to be better and, and, and improve and innovate. And, and, and that's, a, that's a key part of, of, um, of being successful. And, Look, another 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 part of being successful, uh, Deb, don't you think is is the ability to do what we call the SLJs, the shitty little jobs, and, and to do the little things well. Because uh, one of the other things about people, uh, again, when you own your own business, the longer you own it, the, the harder it is to stay in the detail. And you start, uh, and I notice this particularly consulting with larger companies, is you lose an attachment between <laughs> what has to be done versus what you think needs to be done. Yeah. Do, do do you have a do you, do you value the importance and, and people that can do the, the shitty little things well? I love the shitty little jobs and I need to not do them anymore and I've slowly <laughs> started to delegate them and, and I have. However, um, sometimes I'm a list um, person and I do love the endorphins you get from ticking off the tasks on your list. So some days, depending on um, where my head's at, I will tackle the shitty little jobs. But, yeah, our whole team knows that that's, that is the utmost important. You have to do the one percenters. And um, part of um, what Greater Glass is, is known for is um, our trusted product and our first-class service from start to finish. And that is includes from the start to the finish, includes a lot of shitty little jobs along the way. And they all have to be done with the same vigour and perfection that the big important jobs are done, 100%. I think, I think Deb, there's something you said there that I think a lot of people have a, there's a bit of a bit of a I suppose a theme that goes around. I think it comes from you know, Steve Covey and things like that. You do the big rocks first and all this sort of stuff. So you should focus on the strategic stuff. So get in there early, start working on these big rocks and and do all this sort of stuff and and get it done. See, I find that like you, sometimes I'll need and and usually most mornings I'll need a few uh, SLJs to get my momentum up, and then I can tackle the big stuff. I can't jump into the big stuff immediately i need to get a bit of a bit of bit of kind of momentum energetic and ticking a few things off then i'm like right now i'm ready to jump into the big one and i think people need to understand there are different ways of processing that as long as you're not continuously procrastinating on these more important strategic things but those as you say the shitty little jobs is that one percent that if that breaks that one link in the chain breaks the chain is no longer the chain breaks right and and those shitty little jobs are just as important as one of the most important jobs because it's also a link in the chain. And so if one's weak and it breaks, then that chain has no strength whatsoever. It's broken, you know, and, and it's important for, I think, people to understand themselves enough awareness to go, well, I tried that big rock thing, big rock thing, and it was like I was pushing the proverbial uphill, you know, all the time. And, and so then when I started to get that 30 minutes or so of momentum going, answer some emails, do a few things here, clear my inbox up a bit, ah, I feel, you know, charged up then I dive straight into some of the big stuff, you know, which, which is um, a, a you know, different way to do it. Absolutely. I think um, systemize and automate everything you can. Um, but like you, Sean, I need to, um, I can't, I have to, my desk has to be in a certain order. It has to be clean. And if that involves doing a few shitty little jobs first and then set me up, okay, then I, I'm in the right headspace to tackle the big strategic stuff. But we have spent um, a good 12 to 18 months um, getting our business to the next level of systemization and automation. And, and there was, you know, change is hard and, and, and our team, um, not, not everyone was on board from the get-go. Uh, but 
a few months down the track, uh, they can still have their, their pen and paper list if, if that's what um, makes them feel good. But they have realised definitely the value of, of automating uh, what you can to get rid of those shitty little jobs. And how hard was it overcoming, you know, in the trade industry, how hard was it overcoming uh, the resistance to some of the team to actually use the technology? Uh, very hard. And some of those people aren't with us anymore. And the ones that are realise the value of it, so they should be there. And look, I am so blessed. My team, all of them are amazing and an individual in their own right. Okay. And what, over the last, you know, particularly the last three years, I know that uh, in our group, you, you won an award called the Executioner Award, which was for, you know, the well, that's, that sounds right. ominous. <laughs> <laughs> which is a bit scary. Go watch out for Deb. But, uh, <laughs> but it was about how you take things, assimilate, process them, assimilate how it's going to work for you, and then you go and execute. And that's one of those really strong uh, traits that, that I think a lot of people lack is the ability to actually execute. And so, I guess what what are the habits or techniques that you've developed um, over the last few years to, to really allow you to execute and just just get shit done? You know, like what what is it? What have you been able to do? Uh, I think my impatience. That's one thing that it is good for. I want it now. I want it yesterday. Oh, don't don't talk about pa- my partner and I are right in the middle of a whole uh, patience yoga slow the thing down process. Now we're talking about being impatient, being successful. Get it. <laughs> COVID has been great for me, and I've always been told that being impatient is not a good a good thing. But in this case, I think it helps my um, ability to execute. I also have a number of rituals that I uh, start my morning, uh, most mornings, uh, with meditation and a small journal. And I'm talking about a maximum of fifteen minutes. And I only started doing that about two or three years ago. And my brain, I said, I could never, I told myself a story for a very long time. I could never meditate because my brain doesn't work like that. My brain doesn't slow down. However, what I found, uh, even while I still have thoughts coming in and it's not a perfect um, process or meditation by any stretch of the imagination, but it does give me the ability to frame my day. So often things will come up. And an answer to something I've been mulling over for a long time will come up in the morning. Um, I set myself up for the day. I am task orientated. I have goals for the week that I um, try and achieve. And I guess that's that's probably, it's no secret. I'm sure a lot of people uh, do that. And also delegate more and more. And I've I wasn't great at delegating initially and I think I um, didn't spend the time I needed to make things simple for people and I found a huge... Um, I think you and everyone else, Deb. It's like, <laughs> why can't you just... Here, here's, here's the job. Take it. Why can't you just do it? I can do it. It's not that hard. Do what you're told. Do what you're told. This, this and this, you know. But the thing is, what we're giving them is content and, not and they're lacking the context. Correct. The context That's- around it. That's made a massive difference. The reason that you need to do it like this is because the end result is this. And the other thing we introduced as a leadership team um, was I, you know, everyone was giving me their bottleneck every week so I could analyse it and work out how to fix it. And we've reframed that and we are doing a, what, a proper debrief process. So that helps to execute things quicker as well because everybody needs to analyse their week Um, on a Friday and provide me um, the good, the bad and the ugly and what the solution um, to or the outcome of their week was in a debrief format. And it's literally um, forcing them to think about um, what worked and what didn't work. And from that, um, that's pushing our business forward quicker and allowing me to, to execute better because I'm not creating all the solutions they are. And, and then I'm taking away and making suggestions, but my suggestions are based on, um, you know, uh, solutions that they've already put forward. So yeah. that's... that's uh, so at, least, at least it's good to see that you're upholding your executioner status, having taken the learnings from the Afterburner program we did uh, with Boo a few months ago and yes. applying it straight yeah. in the business. Yeah, you know? and running. yes. That's, <laughs> it. that's great, that's great. Yeah. So, Deb, you're, you're talking there a little bit about uh, delegation and getting the team to uh, do more for you. How important to your... So let's have a look at your journey when you started this business. How important 
has having is having the right people around you to accelerate the growth of your business hugely i used to think and on the flip side how if you don't how big an impact does that have uh so we've I've had um, other family members working for us. Um, I used to hire people so I could save them and I didn't even realise I was doing that. Oh, this kid's so nice. Oh, his family's lovely. Oh, he comes from a rough background. Oh, I'll give him a job and that'll help him. That doesn't help um, my business or me or the other people um, that I'm trying to nurture um, and and have a career in, in glass. So I, I learned very quickly that um, not to hire, not to hire for a cultural fit um, and hire people that are smarter than you, that have a different perspective um, in life because many perspectives are better than everyone having the same um, perspective. I've always said to my team, and, and we talk about this on a regular basis, um, I want them to tell me when I need my, to pull my head in. Mm. Just as I will tell them if I'm, you know, and and I think um, most of them, not all of them, I think it's uncomfortable and I completely accept that some personalities will never be able to do that. But um, particularly um, our customer service manager, my right hand, Carol, is, is, I think, very comfortable to say, Deb, that was, that didn't come out right. That was out of line the way you just delivered that to whoever, whatever the situation is. And and, and, and it's still hard to take that feedback, isn't it? Even though you know it's good for you, the, the first time you hear it, you kind of have that, no, this is good for me. It's, yeah, and it, I, I found out, you know, 20 years of learning that self-criticism is good. It still, it still hurts the minute you hear it. Your body's instinct is to say, ah. Uh, and I sometimes like I, I still will... Um, have to go away and process it and it might even be the next day usually it's only a few minutes later that i go oh my god yeah that was wrong (laughs) but you know it is it's it's it makes you feel good because you do feel like you're learning as a person and and you and you don't have to agree either do you do you go and address that if you've if you've realized a few minutes later gone hmm i definitely could have done that a bit better do you then go to the individual and say to them look i've got to own the fact that I was projecting or a bit bit rough or a bit angry or whatever. Do you do you close the loop on that with your team? Yes, I have to for my own peace of mind, but I don't always close the loop immediately because it depending on the scenario, I think timing's everything. And if I think they're not prepared to hear me say that, then and there I might wait until the next day. Yep. Yep. That makes sense. That makes sense. So so I guess one of the um, one of the things that happens a lot in business is 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 overwhelm. He's getting overwhelmed, getting unfocused, and that sort of thing. And it's and it's so prevalent with all these different you know things going on, uh, apocalyptic world, pandemic events, and things you know, or the zombie apocalypse, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, all this other stuff happening that's completely random. Plus, you've got you know people at you on email, phone, Facebook, carrier pigeons, you name it. We've got bombarded with stuff all the time. So it's no surprise that everyone's, you know, getting to the point where a lot of the time there's a lot of potential overwhelm happening. When you get to a point where you're like, ah, there's just too much going on, what are you, what are you observing at that time and how do you then move to go back to a more centred, um, you know, I suppose bringing that emotion down, bring your intelligence back up again and, and just get on with it again? My... Uh, just to take a step back from that, like with all the social media and all the bits and pieces, the first thing um, I think I did was to have um, everything synced to one calendar. Just having to look multi, like I I think I missed a couple of really important meetings. (laughs) In fact, one was a a. 6am meeting, uh, toolbox talk with the whole team, barbecue breakfast, and and I didn't show up. (laughs) I organised and didn't show up. Way to so make an impact, yeah. <laughs> it went down really well. And can you believe it? Nobody even rang to tell me. They just waited for me to rock up at 9 o'clock. <laughs> you forgetting something? I was so embarrassed. So I think then I was like, shit, I need to sync all my calendars into one. So um, that was the first thing. And then having one list that you're working off. Like I've got a scrap piece of paper, obviously, next to me when at my desk. But I do work off one task list, which is which is in our... Um, CRM software and that syncs to my phone so does our job scheduling and so is my Google calendar so everything and my family calendar everything is in the one place color-coded 
I can add stuff in that alarms my husband of kids sport or whatever. And all my other meetings are in one place. So I can't ever, that can never happen to me again. Uh, so that, that helped massively with my overwhelm. The other thing is this whole self-awareness, which sometimes that doesn't happen. Um, last week I was sick with the flu or some sort of a cold thing. I'd like a man flu thing. COVID, there's this thing, it's going around. I know, I actually had to go <laughs> Anyway, uh, so I was, and then um, my dad had a heart attack last week and, um, and then I, you know, just after I'd had my COVID test and I couldn't go and sit, like all this shit was just hitting me in the face. We're getting stuff done at home and the builder had a motorbike accident and blew his knee out. So the whole, my house is still, all, I've got walls missing. It's funny though, isn't it? It's funny how, for whatever reason, it all amalgamates into, it, and, and no doubt about Four weeks uh, before that, everything was going beautifully in life. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. And this week's been wonderful. I'm actually trying not to think about how awesome it is because everything... Well, I'm assuming your, your dad's right. okay. Your dad uh, is okay, My though? Dad's fine. He's had a okay. stick put in and he's at home. But yeah, nice. I, I did recognise... I, I, I had a cry and I thought, oh, my God, what's going on? I thought, oh, my God, because I don't cry. I'm just a non-crying person. And, and I thought, oh, my God, I'm crying. This is bad. And then I thought, no, it's not. It's actually good. This is... This is what should be happening. I'm, and I'm at home and I, you know, get a reality check. I kind of like That's almost awesome. slap myself in the face and because you can stack <laughs> things on top of one another and just, and that's okay. Like it's, it's okay to have a, I think if you're a leader and in that scenario, if you can not be around your team, that's okay too. Just to go, now's not the, the best. Yeah, you've got to be able to lean on them too. You've got to be able to ask for support. And that, the reference that I used to what you were saying before about, you know, having to be a bit selfish, it's actually, you're being selflessly selfish. So you're actually doing it for the purpose of being able to sharp as the best version of yourself. If you're sharp as a crap version of yourself, everyone gets and has to deal with a crap version of yourself. And that's that, and that's that thing. And as you say, you know, if you start stacking these things on top of each other, they start getting really bloody heavy. And having a list where you have them, you know, one after, you know, and I'm not going to use a vertical you know, frame here because that's what a stack is. But if you've got a list with the number one, number two, number three, number four, number five, and you focus on them one at a time, they don't add on to each other. They don't like duplicate the weight. You know, you're not carrying everything around at once. And um, that's a strategy that I've been using the same thing, the single list, the single counter, also stuff for about 15 years. It's incredibly effective. Everything goes in that list. If I think of it, I just go and put it straight in the list. Just an idea. Well, it's it. It sets you up, and, and Deb talked about it before, about getting the endorphin rush. The thing about having those SLJs in one thing, it, if you do it first thing in the morning, that's your first small win of the day. And a small win gets the biochemistry and the neurochemicals flowing in your in your brain and then through your body. And that's power that's for free. That That's, that's extra batteries. Just because we've won, the body doesn't know the difference between winning big or winning small. It has the same chemical reaction. So those little things are the keys to to kick starting your day. And I, I mean, I, we've all had days, right? I don't know. Maybe it's just me. Well, I get absolutely nothing done, but it certainly sets me up for the next day to go right. You know, first thing tomorrow, you got to win small, and just by making that little adjustment, you have a much more productive day. The, the very the principle next day. of make your bed. You know. Yeah. Oh, so absolutely. You start. You start. You start. At, you achieve something as soon as you get up. Yep. I was going to say shave, but then I'm looking at my own face here, realizing that's probably not a really not a good example to use. <laughs> we're not uh, uh, we're not brain surgeons or fighter pilots, like we like. It's oh, like, they're not the, we're not one in the same. Don't worry about that. <laughs> but realistically, and and I say say this to my um, seventeen year old as well. You need to sometimes you just need to sleep on it. Tomorrow's another day. It's not the end of the world. Whatever it is, it seems bad, always is better the next day. It's okay to have a shit day. Right yeah. Absolutely, it's okay to have a shit day. Or many shit days. I, I learned that. Yeah, I learned that in, uh, in my divorce. The value of the draft file uh, is, uh, is, is really, really, really very good because everything, uh, the, the feelings from the day before tend to mellow somewhat um, the, the following day. Uh, Deb, look, it's been, it's been an absolute... Uh, Pleasure having you on on here today. You can what I love about speaking to the few is you you just get a sense the energy from from them and the selflessness and that that comes from from running your own business. So how Deb, as we as we wind up the the podcast, how long have you been pushing the barrow now, Greater Glass? How long have you been on this success journey? Uh, 
17 years, I think. Yep. So we, it all sort of came about when um, I was pregnant with Ryan and he's 17. So on and off, I think I jumped into the deep end and left um, the corporate sort of consulting world. Um, actually, it's about 13 years ago. So since I've had any other income apart from um, our business. So yeah, it's, I'm really proud. This is another over the last three, over the last sort of say three years or so, would you say you've made more progress than the first 14? One, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, it's that whole thing of, yeah, it takes 17 years to become an overnight success, you know? Exactly um, right. yeah. But as, as you said before, Boo, it's that, it's that grinding. It's just continuously showing up, doing what's needed, whether it's shit Surviving, jobs, just, just, some, yeah, uh, just showing just up. Food you've got to show table. up first, you know, yeah. and you've shown up for 17 years, Deb. And despite the first 14 being a bit less, you know, of, of it all coming together, you're creating puzzle pieces. And over the last three, you've been able to put those puzzle pieces together and get a much clearer picture on, on that, that trajectory. So um, you know, we really do want to thank you for sharing some of your journey, uh, Deb. Really, really appreciate it. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, a final question though, before we go, I'd, I'd love to just leave something for our listeners to, uh, to chew on. Um, and the final question is, um, you know, what's the number one thing that you've learned in your life and business or life and or business that you would love to go back and teach a younger version of yourself? Probably don't rush. It's not about the getting, it's, it's about the journey. hundred percent. I was always in a rush to get to the end. The end is the end of your life. I don't want to be there yet. I'm enjoying where I am now, but just to take the time, do things properly and the other key thing is um, someone once said to me and I didn't get it straight away was exchange in abundance. I really truly believe that um, what you give and the energy you put out there and, and how you are to other people um, will definitely come back tenfold. So in everything you do, um, exchange in abundance and enjoy the journey. Fantastic. Once again, Deb, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, looking forward to uh, sharing this with, uh, with our listeners. Yeah, yeah wonderful. That, that's fantastic, uh, Deb. But look, if you're looking at taking advantage of, uh, of ScoMo's home reno, make sure you get on a greater glass and uh, get booked that glazing job with uh, Deb at the team. And that wraps up another episode of The Few. Thank you to our partners, Afterburner, for team building, development and alignment. We understand now how important it is to have the right people around you. Get them on board with where you want to go. Momentum Media, the largest industry publisher in the country, connecting your business to the Australian community. ICMI, Australia's premier speaker bureau, representing the few that do fulfill their life's purpose. And finally, Sean's Inner Circle the business coaching organization for small and medium enterprises looking to make that next step. Thanks again for listening in and downloading today. Please leave a review on whatever platform you are currently listening to this podcast and reach out to our partners who can help you make the transition to the few. Thank you, Deb. Thank you, Sean. Uh, thank you again for sharing what it is to be one of the few. Cheers. Cheers.